Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, panel session at DocFest called Documentary Utopias, Rebuilding the UK Feature Doc Landscape Post-Pandemic. My name is Steve Present and I am a Senior Lecturer in Film Studies at the University of the West of England in Bristol. Uh, so I'm, the, I'm going to be chairing this session uh, as well as participating in it. Our host, unfortunately, uh, Mia Bays, has had um, something of a family emergency, unfortunately. So she's hoping to join us at 11.30, but in the meantime, I'll be, I'll be stepping in. Um, so so, uh, so this, this, this event is organised in response to uh, the recent report that we published as part of the UK Feature Docs Research Project. So um, I'm one of the lead researchers on that project. I'm one of the authors of the report. And one of the things that we want to do following its publication a few weeks back is run a consultation on the, uh, on the state of the UK feature docs sector, which as we evidence in the report um, is really in sort of dire straits. Um, so what we wanted to do for this session is, is to convene a panel of some of the leading uh, producers and directors working in the sector to kind of harvest their thoughts uh, in response to the report and its recommendations um, and to imagine what a different industry might look like and how we might get there. Um, so uh, I'll introduce the panellists in a moment and then I'll say a little bit about how the session is going to work um, and, I, and give, you, give people, for, for those of you that might not have uh, had a chance to do your homework and read the report yet, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a bit of context and background to that too. So uh, our first speaker is Lindsay Dryden, uh, who is an internationally acclaimed Emmy award-winning film director and producer uh, who started out uh, in TV documentary before moving into independent cinema and she has produced shorts and features that have won at Sundance with Unrest uh, a few years back and Emmys and Webbies, Trans in America in 2018 um, hi Lindsay. Uh, uh, and she's directed short and feature documentaries, including Lost and Sound. She's also a proud founding member of Queer Producers Network uh, and Filmmakers with Disabilities. And her work has been released theatrically, shortlisted for Oscar nomination and broadcast on Netflix, PBS uh, and the BBC and others. So hello Lindsay. Hello. <laughs> So our next speaker is Eloise King, who hopefully will pop up on our screen soon. She is uh, another award-winning filmmaker who's focused her career uh, on telling powerful human interest stories, foregrounding marginalized voices. She's a former global executive producer at Vice, where she oversaw its digital channels in the UK and IDs globally. And her work explores fashion, youth cultures, and social justice. Her projects have generated over 100 million views across digital and media terrestrial platforms, including BBC Channel 4, ITV, NTV, a &E, and Al Jazeera English. Uh, her previous titles as a director and producer include The Gatherings for Channel 4, Kids Behind Bars, ITV, Call the Mediator, BBC, Acid Attack for Vice, JME uh, versus Corbyn, Fire Games with Napoli, and the Girls Talk series with Laura Boa. Eloise, not good. Uh, Paul Singh, son, is the British uh, Chinese director and filmmaker, um, and writer whose work is uh, designed to amplify the voices of people who are rarely heard in art and media. So in 2015, Paul founded Joy Productions to produce films about people who challenge the status quo by uh, working in a collaborative way to capture the extraordinary aspects of everyday life. So Paul's documentaries have been broadcast on national television uh, and screened internationally, and they include Leaf of Moss, Invisible Bit in 2015, Dispossession, The Great Social Housing Swindle, Social Housing, Social Cleansing in 2018, and the forthcoming uh, Polystyrene, I Am Cliche, which has come out in 2021. So his first book, Invisible Britain, Portraits of Hope and Resilience, was published in November 2018. And then last, but by no means least, Rachel Wexler uh, has been working in film and television for 30 years uh, and specialises in producing and executive producing ambitious documentary projects for a worldwide audience. 
She's worked on 15 films for BBC Storyville to date, um, collaborated with many award-winning filmmakers, and has been successful in raising a significant amount of finance from broadcasters and platforms worldwide, equity partners, foundations, and crowdfunding. Rachel runs Bungalow Town Productions with her partner, Jez Lewis. As well as producing films, though, Rachel has also devised and delivered two training schemes for emerging producers for Interdoc, set up with initialised films in 2006, uh, ran for several years along with the Scottish Documentary Institute, and then from 2014, the Future Producer School, which I'm sure lots of you know, a six-month training scheme for UK-based emerging producers. So the team has partnered with DocFest, uh, among others, for the last five years, and has trained 75 producers who are all part of a thriving alumni network. So, um, welcome, panellists, and thank you very much for being with us. Um, so I'll say a little bit about the report in a moment, but we've decided to structure this session around in kind of three parts. So based around the, um, the three headings that we organised our recommendations in the report around. So that's diversity, sector development and funding. Uh, so each section, I'll do a little bit of an introduction and context around the the findings in the report um, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for discussion amongst the panelists and then five minutes for uh, Q&A. Um, so, uh, um, have I got a problem with my internet connection? I hope I haven't. I have. It seems fine to me. <laughs> uh, let's see, breaking up a little bit. I'll try and address that once we've started. Um, hopefully you guys can can hear me okay. It all seems fine for me. I might turn, I'll turn my camera off. Maybe that will help. Sorry about this, folks. Is that any better? I am plumbed in, so you can't see uh, my lovely boat. But um, but hopefully you can hear me better. <laughs> so um, okay. So so yeah. So uh, hopefully you got some of that. But we're gonna so we're gonna split the session into three sections. Five minutes introduction from me on diversity, sector development, and then funding. Uh, and then we'll have a, a 10 minute panel discussion and a five minute Q&A from, from, from you guys uh, in the audience, so to speak. You can, if you want to ask a question, just click the Q&A pop there. Um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, and then you can just type up your questions and we'll be, we'll be monitoring them, but also uh, we'll put some um, our administrators in the background will be feeding those questions to us as well. So, so do pipe up if you want to contribute. Um, okay. Also, this session, uh, we've got closed captions available. So if you want those, just click the little CC box down on the bottom corner of the screen there. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to, um, hopefully you'll be able to, to see the closed captions. Um, so, I, before we get going now, I just want to give a brief bit of context to the report. Um, so, how it came about, um, how you can feedback, and then what we aim to do with that feedback. Um, just seeing people, my sound is still really bad, hopefully that's better. Um, ah. Can people... Still very crackly. Oh dear, I'm very sorry about this, folks. Um, I'll try and lean close to the microphone. Um, that sounds a lot better, Steve. From my, from oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a crackly Fine. audio rather than uh, an internet problem, I think. Mm. And that okay. that that's clearer. Sod's law for these problems to um, crop up during this kind of event. I've never had a problem with my mic before, but um, anyway, let's do our best. So yeah, so a little bit of context on the report then. So it's part of a wider uh, research project called UK Feature Docs, which is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and which is a study of the evolution of uh, the Feature Docs sector into a distinct bit of the, the film and television industries over the last uh, 20 years or so. So the research is primarily a cultural history, but we're also very keen to evidence some of the problems and challenges in the sector and develop proposals to, to address those. So obviously keeping it real report is sort of the foundation of this more policy-focused research. 
uh, is based on a survey we did last year that we launched at DocFest and always aimed to um, to present the findings this year at DocFest. So here we are, we're in slightly different uh, unexpected circumstances. So we had a, a really good response and it generated uh, an enormously valuable data set. So 200 of the feature doc producers and directors responded to it. Um, and I hope we've done justice to that in the report. I don't want to say too much about the content in this bit because I'll, obviously I'll introduce it later on uh, in, in the three different sections of the session. But I do just want to say first a massive thanks to everyone who did the survey because it's your work that uh, has has that we're kind of presenting um but also just to, i just want to outline this the next steps from our side so as i said we're sort of in the middle of a seven week consultation on the report now um where we're trying to invite as much feedback as possible on the findings and especially the recommendations um so this event is obviously part of that consultation process but you can also send us written feedback via the form on the website uh on the uk, UK feature docs ukfd.org.uk uh, on the page where you downloaded the report and then we're also running a series of focus groups on July 16th in which we're inviting workers from across the sector to kind of brainstorm policy change in, in small groups if you would like to participate in that do let us know um, and then we're also having a whole range of other kind of private conversations and discussions and so on so when that consultation period ends we'll incorporate the feedback into a set of formal policy proposals which we'll publish sometime in autumn and which will then provide the foundation hopefully for ongoing discussions with BBC, BFI, DCMS, Ofcom and so on and so on about how best to support the sector in the future. Okay so uh, that's it from me in terms of just the context um, and so let's let's uh, move on to the to the first section of the panel um, which which uh, is based around diversity so in terms of our findings in the report if you haven't read it yet uh, it's it's pretty clear that the feature doc sector like the screen industries more broadly has a serious problem with diversity on pretty much every count so 91 percent of respondents were middle class um, women people of color and people with disabilities were significantly underrepresented 65% of respondents were based in London, which is obviously an issue in itself, but which also makes racial diversity initially appear better than it actually is. So we actually had less than five people of colour respond in every nation and region outside London. Uh, in terms of gender, although our respondents were fairly evenly split, inequalities appear as soon as you start to break that data down in terms of role, income and budget. So women are less, uh, are, sorry, are more likely to produce and direct. They earn less money. And even though some women, even though women exist roughly in roughly equal numbers in the sector, uh, they they get far fewer opportunities to, to make work. So only a quarter of feature docs are, are actually directed by women. So thanks, SDI, for that one. Um, and then last but not least, caring responsibilities also present a significant barrier to participation. Mm. So in terms of our, our recommendations on diversity, so obviously there wasn't a scope in the report for detailed proposals on how to address this issue. Instead, we propose that addressing the lack of diversity should be a priority for the sector steering group or council, which is sort of coming into being as the UK DOC group, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, but also as part of that work, we suggested that existing initiatives across the sector should be made available in one place. So at the moment to find out what's, what's, what the initiatives are, you have to look at the different organizations and, and kind of, and so there's a sense in which it's not very joined up. Um, and then also we argue that those initiatives should be evaluated for their effectiveness, strengths, weaknesses, and so on, which is something that um, research shows that really isn't happening. Um, in terms of the sector steering group, Dark Society, Ah, my audio is bad again. I haven't got a headset, I'm afraid. Um, so we might just have to press on. Um, yeah, in terms of the sector steering group, so Doc Society have really um, taken the bull by the horns here and they've convened something called the UK Doc Group, 
which includes most organisations working in the sector, I believe, and it appears to be working well. It's, it's met three times so far. Fox Society are doing the administrative work to kind of keep it going, uh, but it's chaired by a different organisation each time, and it seems to be a really valuable forum. So I think that's a positive um, development on which to build. So that's just the, the overview of the diversity section from me. And it's time to hopefully pass on to some of our panelists with better audio and visual than, than me. Um, who, who wants to, uh, does anyone want to take up the mantle? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll kick off. I think hey, the, um, there is definitely, you know, a problem with, certainly with social class. And I think that um, obviously it's something that isn't readily visible um you know you can generally tell somebody's race um but with with class it's very difficult to identify and i think there's been some good work done um at the bfi that danny lee was involved in over the last couple of years and obviously it's part of funding applications that it's measured now but i think there needs to be much more i mean much more research into it and um and a way of actually trying to like find and fund, you know, filmmakers at various stages. There's a lot of things for young people, but I think, you know, there's also people that maybe, you know, in their 40s, 50s and older that don't really find a way in because they kind of get forgotten because a lot of things are about, you know, young people. So I think definitely more on that would be mm. helpful. Um, just feeding off, I guess, of what you've said, what you've come back with in terms of the new, like, sort of doc initiative that started, which, um, I'm also a part of. So as the organisations that you mentioned, um, I run Women on Docs, which is a voluntary organisation. And one of the suggestions I did make that I think is something that can be sort of used across the board really is just really considering who is in the room or at the table in terms of these decisions being made. Um, I think from an optics perspective, as well as a sort of it's sort of a genuine sort of deeper need for like um, diversity to take place within those conversations around restructuring. I think of um, possibly the 30 plus attendants, I'm the only black woman. There were three, I understand, women of colour um, and no men of colour um, within that group. And so I think at the core of what we're doing in terms of making these recommendations, it feels really important to, to take inspiration from the moment that we're in, things that are happening on a broader scale. So when you talk about sort of the inequity within the industry at the moment, we know that one, a big, in, a big sort of terminology that's in contention is BAME, precisely because what it does is it obfuscates some of the real distinct differences, not least in terms of economic or sort of, you know, uh, social class differences between black, Asian and other ethnic minorities. But um, it also sort of tells us at the moment that people who are from those diverse backgrounds, so BAME again has been sort of lumped together, are sort of disproportionately affected in this moment of crisis. And I know that when the report was being made, it wasn't something um, that anyone could have anticipated. But as we move forward in a sort of, in with that very much, I think at the forefront and in mind, I think how the industry responds to this um, is crucial. And I think at the moment, I think there's been a lot of thinking about how we return to what once existed. And I think that the actual utopia is a really drastic and radical look at how we change for, the, for a better future that feels more equ equitable and one that really understands intrinsically that um, race, disability and class are like sort of inexplic inextricably linked. Um, and I think some of the sort of the idea around the report that diversity was like a really top priority is something that I really sort of stand behind and agree with, um, particularly um, because <clears throat> I had a conversation with Doc Society who were kind enough to sort of share some data in terms of where the funding is. And we also know that the BFI and Doc Society um, are really our two key funders along with the BBC in terms of the Doc landscape. And of 81, since the Doc Society has had that pot of money, of the 81 talent that have been supported, actually five of those are black. And 14, I believe, are BME. So I don't know whether or not that means that under the BME category, people who are black are also counted within that, so therefore counted twice or separately. But I think to anyone's ears, um, it's clear that there's a lot more that needs to be done if only 5% of people are being represented or funded. Yes, quite, quite. Um, Lindsay, were you indicating you wanted I to speak there? I was. I think to follow up on 
Eloise's point, um, it's really about who gets to make decisions. Um, decisions need to be made by people who actually represent, in the same way that storytelling needs to happen, that needs to come from people who actually represent the experiences, the perspectives, the lived experiences, um, you know, of these underrepresented groups, which I think collectively on this panel, we happen to represent in several ways today. Um, it isn't about going back to the previous structure because the previous structure didn't work at an economic level, but it certainly didn't work at a level of representation equity. And yeah, I just want to agree, I think with what Eloise said, it's not about trying to rebuild what we had. We need to build something different. And often that means bringing new decision makers into that, into that sphere and actually empowering them to be influential, not just to be heard on panels, on um, uh, in situations where their advice can be taken into account and then decided upon by the same people. You know, that there, there's, there's some tremendous organizations and people in the field, but so many parts of our society are not represented, particularly around race, around class, mm -hmm. around gender, around disability. Um, and we cannot build an equitable field if we don't change that. Mm, yeah, thanks. I, I agree totally. I mean, just going even further and saying, it's interesting that a documentary group, a core group, is being set up um, immediately without the report having really been absorbed or been, you know, I'm not sure. I would just, I would just question, um, you know, how these groups are set up, who's deciding who's on the panels, who's deciding, I mean, all of that, and just say, can we just take a pause to absorb this report properly? before there's an immediate reaction from all the key players that are already, they already have a place at the table. There's no disputing that. So can we just take a bit of a pause and say, who's being asked to have a place at the table? If, if the key players, the people with the uh, power um, in the documentary space right now are the ones mainly creating this, this core forum, it's, first of all, if you invite other people in, is that a safe place for them to actually talk about what's really going on, firstly, because many of the people being invited in are both advisory, ad being asked to advise, but not really, but also their, their careers are being built on the back of those relationships. So how can that be clearly safe for people? And I would really challenge it in saying, in order to really move ahead now, um, and like and like all of the other panelists are saying, let's go back to real fundamentals here. Let's start with the bones of an organisation being brought, you know, being, let's grow this from a very uh, new place. Let's start again. Um, and I think there are many, many people uh, from all different kind of backgrounds and economic backgrounds and who some of these, pe some people have never made a feature doc. So it, 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 I would really want to include the people that have wanted to and haven't been able to access this space, have not never been given any public money, have never been able to, to get in. And I want to know why. I want to actually, I want to, I would, I would prefer to know why that's happened as well. Yeah, um, yeah. No, rather just, than just always talking to the people that have been successful. Yeah, can I just pipe up in response to that quickly? Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's really tricky because obviously Doc Society uh, have had the, we've been kind of liaising with Doc Society a bit with the research. They absolutely were key to the survey in terms of pushing it out there. Um, and in their defense, they have been very, they've been pushing like at the, the three UK Doc Group meetings so far, pushing this idea of like who we need to, widen this up open this up but i think obviously it's quite difficult because they're the ones with the resources just about even though they haven't got many resources themselves either yeah they're the ones with the resources to kind of keep it alive because it's obviously doing this kind of system change it takes a lot of work doesn't it so and then just quickly on where it's come about i, I think originally doc society convened that meeting as a way for us to kind of share some preliminary findings from the research it wasn't really intended as a to become the the uk doc group that people have ended up calling it 
Um, and then coronavirus kind of happened and it stole our thunder in that we were meant to present some of the research which we still did, but then it very much became about addressing the urgent, immediate kind of um, challenges of the, of the virus. So I think um, that's, but having said that, that's a really valuable contribution. And I think like maybe one of the things that uh, we need to kind of focus on is, is expanding that and thinking through the, the structures of the, of the group and how to, yeah, address some of those issues with it being organized by people that are also already kind of at the table, as you say. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm not disputing the good work that's been going on. And, the, and, and of course, it does come down to who's got the infrastructure, where's it, where are the resources coming yeah. from, all of that. And I totally yeah. get that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that the doc group shouldn't exist. I'm just maybe saying there, are, like you're saying, Steve, there should be other advisory panels of yeah. people that are really not in the room necessarily with somebody that they're trying to get funding from, that feel very safe, that it's mm -hmm. a confidential space, because there are some there are some difficult things to talk about yeah, i think absolutely. before you can come up with the suggestions of how yeah, to change it yeah, that's yeah. that's all but not to disparage the work that's actually happening sure 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 I just wanted uh, to add one sort of quite just anecdotal point to what you said rachel in terms of self identification i think that's really important across the board in terms of um you know who puts their hand up and says they're, they're within the sort of feature doc space um i've sort of you know been invited onto this and onto sort of several panels but i've never made a feature documentary and so at what point do people you know in that broader harder to reach in those harder to reach communities feel that they have admittance to say that they're part of it and i think steve i know that you mentioned that you know um reaching out to sort of further and being able to get um i think there were like four sort of five respondents um in the regions from bme backgrounds and so i think that could just also be like just a really in some ways conceptual but like an interesting question to think about in terms of how people feel that they belong to this community and that they can feed into that as well yeah 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 that's a, yeah. That's a really valuable yeah. point as well um, May I just, add yeah, go on, an it? extra thing? Um, in terms of sort of be becoming and belonging part of a community, I think there are examples of in the US doc space where that's handled, you know, really well. Firelight, Brown Girls, Doc Mafia, Queer Producers, Filmmakers with Disabilities, AMDOC, ADOC, Documentary Producers Alliance. Those organisations do not just exist, but they're funded to exist. You know, women on docs, I hope it's okay to say hello, Louise, but women on docs shouldn't be doing that work without infrastructure funding without the opportunity to be effective and you know uh be sustainable and i think there are models for how we do that but in addition to i know we'll talk about funding more later but in addition to thinking about who needs to be at the table how do we as a sector equip those different voices to be at the table in an equitable way because equity so often equals having the time and the resources to be part of those conversations. Yeah, thanks Eloise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, so should we, I think that's, we are five minutes behind schedule, but let's invite, um, let's invite some contributions from the, from the participants, from the audience, if you're out there. I think there's about 100 odd people uh, on participating in this event. So do pipe up and say who you are and where you're from. Um, cheers for mentioning that, Sarah. Uh, Sarah Moss is there. Um, hello. Um, so yeah, do, do, do pipe up if you want to contribute. Um, and I think just, yeah, one of the things that's, that's really striking and really complicated from someone trying to develop recommendations is how all these things intersect with and overlap with each other. So obviously, like the concentration of the industries in London is a big class issue and uh, the, the kind of the lack of um, uh, people of colour in the sector is also a, a class issue. Um, and, and all of these things relate to resources as well, uh, as you just, as you say, in Lindsay. Um, so, so we can come on to funding uh, in a moment, but just let's uh, focus on sector development then. Um, so, so I think another thing that's kind of abundantly clear from the report um, is that the sector is in need of significant support and development, especially outside London. So, it, the sector is is kind of chronically underfunded I think that's clear but again we'll come on to that later but it's also an undervalued part of the the wider film and television landscape so um, policymakers and screen sector organizations 
often have quite scarce knowledge of the documentary community and how it operates as a distinct kind of independent ecosystem that's separate from the fiction filmmaking world and I think there's also a range of training and education needs um, and, and especially respondents to the survey also emphasized how the sector lacked a kind of any a sense of structure and coordination so um, in, in terms of our recommendations for this as I said our first one is that a sector steering group or council should be convened um, and that that group is then a kind of a pretty key means through which to address a range of issues in the sector to do with information sharing uh, and other sector-wide initiatives. Um, and I think the, the, the funding of that group is obviously a, a really key uh, element in terms of ensuring that it's not just people that already have the resources that get to do all the work and then it's a self-perpetuating um, cycle. So I won't go through all of our other recommendations just in terms of sector development, but just to note a few. Um, so one of the things that we felt was that wider non-doc specific organisations should take responsibility for having increased uh, in-house knowledge of the sector. So it shouldn't really, it's not really on for documentary filmmakers to get a like, I don't know, or ask Doc Society sort of response. Um, from from screen sector wide bodies. So again, you know, it's not like they're flush with cash either necessarily. But I think there is that that, that it shouldn't just be on the documentary sector to to, to address that. Um, there's there's a need for improved communication, transparency, and decision making was something that came through really strongly. Uh, and parity of provision across the UK. So a good starting point with that would be even just kind of working out exactly what is available where across the nations and regions in terms of both organizations uh, and organizational support and, and funding, which wasn't something that was immediately apparent. Um, and then just, just the, there's also um, a significant issue in terms of documentary filmmakers' mental health. So uh, liaising with the film and TV charities mental health task force would be a sensible step forward there. Ditto, liaising with screen skills on the training and educational needs the sector respondents identified. Um, uh, people were talking about a range of business and craft skills, although I'm always reminded of Elham um, Shakarafar's point about like, I'm going to scream if someone offers me more business development, I just need money. Um, but again, we can come on to the funding issue. Um, uh, yeah, and I think also we said that, you know, it's, it's particularly important that training providers focus on how filmmakers can access foundations and private investors, again, which is a class issue, I think. Um, as funding sources, given that these funding sources, foundations and private investors, are among the most common sources of funding for uh, UK feature docs. Um, so again, you know, I mentioned that as a training issue rather than a funding one, uh, given that we'll talk about funding in the, in the final se se section of this session. Um, so, sector development uh, analysts, who wants to have the first bite of the apple on that one? Um, I think is I think it goes without saying that in terms of sector development, some of the really big losses are things like the Future Producer School that um, Rachel used to run. I think that kind of crosses. I think what as for anyone who didn't know what the Sheffield Future Producer School was, essentially what it did is it selected a number of um, producers or would be feature documentary producers and put them through an intensive sort of, I think it was like an intensive week of training, but then existed as an ongoing resource for people to um, reconnect afterwards. I know that Lindsay um, as an alumni of that, I also was as well as like a number of, in fact, sort of most people I now know in the industry are a result of having met them through that and also being able to feel like, you know, this sort of place at the table conversation was able to happen through introduction to Sheffield and the festival world like that. Um, I think one of the benefits of um, those kinds of skills driven, I completely hear what Elham was saying. And I think Elham is, is an incredible example of someone who's been so tenacious in terms of reorganizing actually the documentary landscape in terms of distribution and doing it. But, you know, she's one person and can't carry it alone. And I think, the point of um, training at this point really does look at how you seed those ideas of making the industry feel accessible, offering skills and literacy around the business. And I think that feels like something that's in sort of desperate need, especially when it's not just people who are from lower income backgrounds who are struggling to get in or struggling to make money. It seems that 
even those who I think are some something sort of like the largest um, proportion of people who are making films are actually self-funding and if they're not making any money at the end of it they also have something to learn so I think yeah. um, training definitely feels like a, a, a big a big thing that's um, sort of a miss and then beyond that <clears throat> I think training labs that exist like um, the assembly so open city docs assembly has been a really great new innovation on the doc landscape in terms of giving directors and producers an opportunity not just to be sort of funded an extra 10k towards their projects but to be able to really look at the fundamentals of what filmmaking is i think for a lot of us within the industry it's not do we want to come here to make money but how do we hone a craft that creates this you know amazing work work that we're really proud of and so um i think it's a it's a big topic but one that's tackleable because we know that in the feature um, fiction space, there are actually significantly more of those labs and those sort of intensive periods where we acknowledge there's a need to nurture and to continue to steer and um, look after those relationships and those skills. Cheers, Eloise. Yeah, really valuable points. Um, Mia, you've joined us. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm sorry. Feeling that's fine. No, no worries. Ill parent. Um, my um my audio and camera has been being dysfunctional which sods law um so so i'll pass the chairing over to you if that's all right i'm not sure if i'm any better or not but um but yeah um shall I, uh, so, so i'll just briefly just introduce you here so me is a um an otter winning and bafta nominated creative producer uh, who worked in, in prior to producing, worked in sales, marketing, distribution, and exhibition across the UK in both docs and fiction. Uh, she took over Bird's Eye View in 2016, um, did it do running as a year round charity, um, uh, and she also uh, runs the, the Future Leaders in Distribution uh, Initiative, a leadership training program for women with seven plus years of distribution experience. Um, and Mia also produces Sundown London. So, so Mia, so we're, we're, we're talking, I know you've got a lot to contribute to this as well as a host, so we're um, just discussing sector development issues. Uh, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but if anyone else wants to pipe up as well, let's, uh, let's get back to the discussion. Sure. Um, okay, so obviously I have, I don't know what you've covered, but I'll, yeah. yeah, I'll pick up hosting, Steve, your audio is not great. So I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pick up from here. Um, so um, what I just wanted to throw in in terms of around sector development was putting the voices of distribution and exhibition into the space. I think that's really very important and I think that maybe could be where the report goes next and um, I don't know how much you've covered that sector yet. I talked to a couple of distributors, um, they hadn't seen the report. Um, I talked to modern films um, who do a lot of docs like um, Shooting the Mafia and Be Natural, they're two films that Birds Eye View worked on. Um, and then I talked to Zach from Republic um, who did Fosama and Toni Morrison, Peace mm. As I Am, which is a film that we wrapped him up to pick up, I'm proud to say. And, and both of them were saying how healthy they think for them documentary is actually and that they have a strong appetite to pick up more documentary, um, but that again, that it feels like in these kind of consultations often um, there's more of a focus often on broadcasters and not on exhibition yeah. and yeah, yeah. sector so, development across, across obviously not just theatrical, but VOD too. You know, we know how important the streamers are, yeah. but also independent distributors are, are vital because they're often doing the work, you know, the big guns pick up the big commercial Films sure. and, and then the smaller guns are, are absolutely essential to most of us. Um, can I just just mention just briefly because that might not be clear as well for people why we're focusing on producers uh, and directors in the report. So we decided to try to, to target very specifically that sector of the industry for the survey because it operate. It's very difficult to design a survey that does the sector overall. Um, so that's why we're focused so um, so much on this sector, and then we are we're doing um, a range of interviews and, and and also focus groups with distributors and exhibitors. Right. Um, so we we are hoping in the the policy proposals that come that will be published in the autumn there will be a, a, a section dedicated to that because obviously you know coherent policy needs to be working across uh, the the value chain. Um, so yeah yeah. 
Could I add to the topic of sector development that, um, and I've just been looking at some of the questions that people are asking and the conversations people are having during this. Um, it really feels that the report is an enormously helpful set of data to tell us what is going on and what needs to happen. And I think our community, our documentary community, knows what needs to happen. I think our documentary community has known that for some time. And the question is, in terms of sector development and everything else, who is responsible for making that happen and for resourcing that? And it feels like a lot of what we've discussed so far is who should be part of those conversations that haven't been part of those conversations already in order to create the systemic change that we urgently need. Um, but I don't know that anybody on this panel right now is the person who can, who can answer who is responsible for making this change. What is the official collaboration of organizations, independence, um, and where do those resources come from? And I think what's so important about a conversation like this is that we don't just talk about it. Something happens next. We do something next. So I suppose my question, and I don't even know who it's for, um, is how do we, in really practical terms, transparent, equitable, courageous, new terms, not working like our system has worked before, how do we take that forward and actually take action? as opposed to discuss these fantastic things we need to happen that for whatever reason haven't happened already. Who wants to take that one on? <laughs> <laughs> I think Lindsay made a really good point. I think none of us have the power to decide how that happens. And so I think that's where um, maybe someone else is better place to answer, like where, where that step in happens. Is it a series of like pledges? So we've seen that work really successfully. I also work in commercials, like in, in the sort of in advertising, for example, Free the Bid had, you know, one in, interrupt, uh, sort of intervention into the industry by saying of the X amount that's commissioned, three of these always pitching have to be a woman and now they're looking at doing that in terms of people of colour so I think one it's like obviously it's a multi-pronged response but one that effectively as always is very much in the hands of the gatekeepers and so whilst it's really important that people are listening to us whilst having those conversations people who are commissioning who are looking over funds and who are creating budgets I know that Krishnan um, sort of mentioned the hundred million um, pound diversity fund that's coming up and maybe it's sort of better suited for the funding conversation in a moment but it's like within the conception of that this conversation and these sort of considerations need to be at the heart so where previously Storyville have been obviously in, in sort of a long-term and ardent support of documentary filmmaking what everyone's hearing from the port that that's that's not enough in terms of financial terms so how does what we know now about the changes that people want to happen and the money they have translate directly to um, availability of money and in all the ways that Lindsay said in, in sort of much more equitable terms and so yeah I think it's a difficult question it's not it's not effectively we are the we are the disruptors everyone on this panel who comes from a sort of a somewhat um, marginalized or sort of differently considered background is a disruptor and, and a sort of interventionist within the system and so those who hold the power um, do need to take responsibility and I think that's also about them self-appointing as much as it is us sort of saying we're the people in need they need to say we're the people with the power. I totally agree <clears throat> and I think um, it, it seems to me that we deal with the kind of middle management gatekeepers as producers and filmmakers we're dealing with people who always have someone that they have to go to yeah. so they've always got a head of a channel or a boss to go to and so we're we we only ever see those people really and the people who really are accountable are faceless you know that usually suits you know who 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 have people talking on their behalf but we're you know we're not blaming out the middle management gatekeepers that we deal with i i would like to know on a government level when they're giving you know we've got publicly funded broadcasters and there's no space for documentaries how did that happen mm -hmm. how can we lobby what what would make that change where where how are the funds allocated who decides what the audience wants and the conversation there for me is also opening up to the public almost and saying do you want documentary now i want to know who are the end users who watches documentary why are they considered valuable not just us saying we think they're valuable 
believe us, they're valuable. Mm -hmm. I want to know, we will need to feed into this conversation. There is an audience out there and we're making films for an end user. And um, we, we want to represent, give voice to everybody, you know, a whole range of people, especially underrepresented people. And there is an audience out there that are not being served right now. So I, I really think it's important to bring in the audience into this conversation as well. I'd love to add to that, um, that those audiences really aren't out, really are out there, those, those underrepresented audiences, those underserved audiences. If you look at the literal millions of people with disabilities in the UK who don't see themselves on screen, who don't see themselves represented behind the camera, beyond the uh, ethical and moral argument, there's a financial argument there. Yep. Those are people who pay for media content i don't like those words but that's that's what we'll use um and they're not being served because the way that audiences are talked to and engaged with i think currently by the traditional broadcasters is quite narrow and quite limited and some of the most exciting work that's happening in the sector has been you know with together films with organizations like elham shakarafad's company um with birds like view uh with women on docks um, and with films like Unrest, it's actually going to those audiences who don't feel that they're welcome tr in traditional spaces, but who are there and who are hungry for that storytelling. Um, and that I think applies really strongly to class as well. Um, you know, there's a sense that media is made by a certain class of people. Therefore, why would it appeal if you aren't, you know, part of that community? Um, and so audience development and audience engagement has to be a really key part of sector development and as you said rachel actually talking to and listening to audiences but not just to the ones that the bbc talks to already i think as well one thing we should consider is making cinemas more, more accessible um i mean art house cinemas are generally quite intimidating places um when particularly when you're young but i think also as when i was you know young and being working class you know i was they're not welcome in spaces the way that they're designed. Um, even little things. I mean, personally, when I go to the cinema, I don't eat anything because, you know, I can wait till afterwards. But, you know, you don't get popcorn. And young working class kids want to go to the cinema and have popcorn. They don't want to go there and kind of feel that they're looked down on. So I think in terms of, you know, distribution exhibition, we need to make the spaces themselves more welcoming, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to now move on to the um, funding um, section of our conversation. Steve, do you want to? Um... Yeah, um, can I can I just quickly just add one thing just on the yep. sector development just because I mean the in terms of whose responsibility it is, I think DOCS is obviously sometimes in an awkward situation because it's between broadcast and uh, an independent film, but I think we should be looking at the British Film Institute which you know uh, uh, have, have responsibility for the sector. I think the BBC, Channel 4, I think the commercial broadcasters have a role to play as well. Um, they, they, they have a public service remit, even though um, they're, they're commercially funded. I think um, DTMS is obviously <laughs> of the BFI in terms of the um, awarding government funding. And I think Ofcom as well. And I think maybe, obviously, this is a marathon rather than a sprint. And the, the way I'm kind of thinking about this at the moment is that that work needs to be funded and that there should be particular focus groups or working groups dedicated to targeting each of those sectors. Um, and just because I wanted to just kind of lay down some sort of concrete ideas in terms of how to take it forward. Um, but yeah, it'd be good to know what people think about that. Um, but yeah, so funding. Um, so the two key things in the report, I think, in terms of funding were that there's an urgent need for more funds in the sector, but that there's also a need to diversify funders uh, for greater plurality of funders. So there's a strong sense that too little funding is concentrated within too few funders. Uh, so in terms of increasing plurality of funders, obviously this is tricky when there's already so little funding around, uh, but if I network seems to us like it's to provide a sensible foundation on which to build here so it's an existing nationwide infrastructure however i think with doc society currently the main the, the documentary bit of network network funds are being concentrated back into the main london-based funder so uh also regional um 
documentary filmmakers, unlike fiction filmmakers, are then you know, directed back into London. So that's that struck us as a sort of a problem, but obviously it's difficult because it's not easy to replicate Doc Society's expertise, knowledge, and the you know the good work that they do and the relationships around the country. It does seem like steps could be taken uh, to increase increase plurality and decision making there. Um, in terms of increasing funds. Obviously, this is so much depends on that. So one of the main kind of planks of our, our recommendations there is that is an increase in the proportion of national lottery funds ring fenced for documentary. So this is currently only 9.1%. So we're suggesting it be increased to between 20 and 25%. So that would see Doc Society's BFI funds increase from 1.8 million to between 4.2 and 5.2. Um, from the television side, increased support for feature docs from public service broadcasters is essential. Um, obviously, these are super challenging times for the BBC and Channel 4 for different reasons, but the fundamental values of public service media are more important than ever. I think that's an argument that has come up here, but I think we need to be making that argument uh, that feature docs are, you know, a critically important service, public service genre alongside arts and news and children's programs that are badly underserved at the moment. Uh, Storyville needs a budget of at least five times its current size uh, to be kind of commensurate with its competitors in Europe. Um, Channel 4 should have dedicated series of feature docs. Uh, we also think there's a role to play, as I said, for, for commercial PSPs, ITV and Channel 5, which should have commissioning quotas um, for the form. And the brick box as well, uh, you know, doesn't represent feature docs at the moment, they don't exist on the platform, uh, and they should. Um, so there isn't time to discuss all the our funding recommendations here, but we also we touched on ring fencing funds for documentary in the Creative Europe replacement funds, strengthening UK producers' position as international co-production partners, something that came through pretty strongly, more funds for development, supporting more creative or experimental work, um, as well as a range of amendments to the film tax relief for documentary, uh, including increasing it to 50%. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of it in a nutshell, but obviously there's a lot of detail under the bonnet there that I haven't talked about. I hope you can hear me still. Is that, was that clear-ish? Yep. yep, we got you, Sue. Thank you. Okay, who wants to tackle this first? Rachel, I know you have a lot to say on this. I might pick on you. Always have a lot to say on this. Um, <clears throat> there's an awful lot there, isn't there? I mean, I think for a very healthy ecosystem, we need everything. We don't want to, uh, we don't want everyone to think, oh, I'm making a feature doc, I'm just going to go to public funding and I'll get all my money from that. Pay. You know, we, we don't want them to only make very commercial work and go to platforms and you know big broadcasters because they they're having to make very commercial work for a healthy ecosystem we need a wide range of filmmakers a wide range of funding sources and i must say that the just just to say a very positive note about the producers the um and the filmmakers around the world they are some of the most tenacious um imaginative amazing hard-working people you can't make a feature doc without being <laughs> pretty awesome um so it, using all those all that all that passion um i think one of the things that is really really important is to encourage the market to see us as viable we are we are viable we can make great films we win lots of awards we 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 are a healthy we we can be a very healthy professional sector but the equity funding available at the moment um, is usually for $5 million plus narratives, uh, narrative films. And I think that we really could in, engage with some of the equity funders, both altruistic e equity, who are people that are, have a passion for, this, for uh, social activism, and there's that kind of equity, which is hopefully a bit softer, but also the harder equity, the, you know, the, fina the financial companies who probably would come in and work on docs if there was some kind of shared mechanism or better mechanism for that. So at the moment, for instance, I'm talking to a company who's saying, if you want to borrow more than 200 grand, we might be able to work with you. Uh, the legal fees might be 15,000 pounds to borrow that kind of money, plus se several percent to borrow it. Now, if, you've only, if you're only borrowing 200,000 pounds, that's a very expensive pot of money. 
for, for your equity. So I think what my recommendation would be, um, along with the, the public broadcasters, along with the commercial broadcasters, along with the BFI, everybody else is, I really think that we need to bring in those potential financiers and say, we're making really good stuff here and we're making limited series. Now those can make serious money as well. Can, you, can we please talk about mechanisms to maybe they could come together and fund slates so that we have that, that you know, that it's beneficial for everybody and not all these individual producers going to individual financiers, which isn't really working. So that's one thing that is really on my mind about equity. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. I think that's well, a really great idea about funding right, that you had, Rachel, because I know that in, in these, um, I guess, like in terms of Netflix and like advertising funded projects, that's been a resource that I think much more successfully people maybe have been able to lean into. So obviously it's separate and away from um, things like um, sort of philanthropy, but quite specifically money that's geared towards making that. Whilst obviously documentary uh, wants to retain a space in which it doesn't feel like you're just sort of putting out puff pieces. Yeah. I think it's really, really critical in terms of making long form um, documentary, especially, if, you know, Channel 4 currently isn't in that space, ITV isn't in that space in terms of doing a feature documentary, but what we know since lockdown is that people have been absorbing them in sort of, like, you know, vulnerable amounts, and all of the ideas that I think a lot of broadcasters had around the sort of sophistication, how to make accessible, how to make easy content, is kind of dispelled, isn't it, when you realise that people actually have the capacity and the brain power that we know they do, which is, you know, reflected in the community of people who are also making the work. But I think looking at those other funding models feels like it's really critical. So can you fund across a slate where there's a number of, there are a number of actors and agents involved in terms of, is it that each, each episode is perhaps like funded by someone else? Is it that you can look at bringing in money from outside sources commercially who are always really keen to get involved in long form so I know that particularly like doing advertising as well as a, as a, as a means of sort of sustaining myself within a documentary um, feature documentary space that when I go to you know Adidas or Nike they are actually interested in making long form content and doing and really resonating within that feature documentary space so I think it is also going to take a lot of um, bridging the gap I think Charlie's been really successful at the Guardian in terms of how he looks at you know, pots of money that exist elsewhere and how they aggregate actually to, to sort of be able to pay for content um, or pay for those streams within The Guardian. But I think that needs to be an approach that, that happens across the board and with sort of obviously larger sums of money in order to help people make the kinds of films that the industry already know that, you know, that British filmmakers are renowned for. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eloise. It might There's sound a like a um, slightly naive idea and I hope it doesn't but I think that's something that we need to address as we address funding sort of related to what you said Rachel about slate funding is that we are all working very very individually in the UK because it's competitive because mm -hmm. there's so few resources um, and I've been really lucky to do a lot of work in the US and part of the reason I did that is honestly because they don't know where, which school I went to because from my accent so it's much easier for me to access resources because people trust me with those resources because they can't quite recognize if I you know went to Oxford or not um, which I didn't and you know it, it's it's so for me personally I've it's been a welcoming space but I think that's because not just because there are more resources although by number of filmmakers you know there aren't in some ways but people work on a sort of a collective basis people share resources people share information um, people share learning about how to engage with different kinds of funding, how to bring different kinds of funding together. And, you know, if we're talking about a sort of documentary utopia, naive though it might sound, I think it would be extraordinary if we had a British community that feels mutually supportive because we're not all desperately scrabbling for resources against each other. Because for all our brilliant relationships as an individual level, I think that is what's happening. And so some people are able to access certain resources um, in fantastic ways and that is based on their expertise but could we create a community in which we share that expertise and so you know the opportunities for everybody increases but that actually supports people who may have created those opportunities or, or been able to acquire the expertise in the first place. Um, I think one of the other problems with funding is um, you often don't get feedback on why you've been rejected and obviously that's because resources are limited and you know there isn't the time but I think if you're going to, you know, have, if you're going to be given a pot of money and you're going to have a fund, then you need to 
give everybody that applies feedback rather than just you know the standard you know we can't give you feedback and I think if that means funding one less production then it's a more communal thing to do. Mm -hmm. There's another point here about slate funded productions going back to, to Rachel's um, com, um, comment um, from Sonia Hen Henrici. Slate funding models are a really interesting idea, Rachel. So many individual producers projects. Should we have more collaborations amongst producers? Yeah, that's a good point. It certainly happened in the fiction space much more. A lot more funds have been driven by producers or, or exec producers that I don't feel like for some reason has translated into the doc space. I don't know why. I, I think goes back to what Lindsay was saying. I really agree with what you were saying, Lindsay, about this competitive, mm -hmm. almost gladiatorial uh, situation that we have in documentaries is, I mean, and, and I would, and I would say that it's changing a lot. You know, a few years ago, um, Sheffield Doc Fest really led the way with saying we're not going to do a public forum. We're going to have, you know, the producers and filmmakers sitting at a table and the decision makers come to them in the meat market. And that was a really big, seemed like a really big thing. And people are following that now. But we still have a lot of public pitching. We have a lot of gladiatorial competitive um, where we are pitched against each other. And I'm not sure who benefits from that at all. Uh, I think sometimes people say, oh, it's because the people watching in the audience will get to learn. Well, they don't get to learn about, uh, you know, it's not a safe place for filmmakers to actually talk about their craft or to talk about things. It just seems to me that it ticks the box to say, look how we're publicly spending money, look how, and that's really anti everything that I, need th I think needs to happen. I think that we need to take away the, we need to create the level playing field. And, you know, to go back to the Oxford or the, you know, the, the, the public school thing is, you know, we, don't, we didn't all grow up understanding how to play the rules of those, that game. Mm -hmm. And that game, you know, is, it, it, we've got to look at, is the game rigged? And how can we create that level playing field? Mm -hmm. um, and taking away the, the, the horrible levels of competition amongst filmmakers, which is divisive, makes people not trust each other, makes people concerned about, can I, can I collaborate with this other person who does know things, but am I going to be, are they going to rip me off? There's all of these anxieties, it's very, and, it, and it does affect, going back to mental health, that affects people's mental health hugely in this industry, I know it does. Uh, from lots of people talking to me um, and my own personal experience. So I think, I, I think, you know, the competition is a massive factor. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to add to that or any of these questions or comments at the side um, to address? Um, people were talking about the DPA earlier and yes. Eloise mentioned that there's an organisation that yep. is springing up in the UK. Um, so the DPA does have some international members um, and at the moment, I'm just reading from an email, um, they're thinking about whether to focus purely as, it's a documentary producers alliance in the US and it's a um, membership organisation of hundreds of independent documentary producers now. Um, they're thinking about how to work internationally, how to run those um, international uh, conversations um, and in the meantime, Doc Society has made a small amount of money available um, on an in, so, sort of talking to a number of UK feature doc producers informally who are all sort of talking to each other now. And there's a, an organisation that's very gradually being set up to bring together UK documentary producers. There's lots of conversations to be had and many, many more people to be invited into those conversations. Um, and that is happening gradually behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, Great, thank you, Lindsay. Actually, Charlie Phillips just said there's also a documentary association of Europe that has just started and is aiming to do some positive work. Does anyone know about that? Anyone part of that? No. Okay, so that's, there's so many amazing comments coming in and lots of incredible recommendations. And given that this whole conversation is about creating a radically different UK feature doc space. I feel like this recording and all these comments need to be collated because there's that together is, is going to be an incredible resource. So Steve, I hope we can yeah, do that and pull that together. Yeah, be, yeah. I mean, go back to, sorry, just to, just to go back. I don't think we, I, I don't feel like um, I've underlined the, the, 
you know, we talked about equity funding, but I do think having the strands on British television is, is an emergency. I would put it out. You know, that's probably one of the biggest things that could possibly happen. Um, and also a level of, you, you know, transparency about why they're choosing things the way they are, um, what they think the audience wants. Um, and also there's a huge disparity um, between how much uh, some departments pay for content and how some channels will offer uh, tiny, tiny amounts of money uh, for the same film when on completion. And there's a huge disparity there that doesn't, doesn't help filmmakers um, actually get paid for their work. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the other thing to uh, really highlight is that um, when a filmmaker talks very openly about, they need to be able to talk openly about how much a film actually costs, including their labor. Um, and not just pretend that it didn't cost anything so that they're attractive to, to a broadcaster who then say, oh, we'll pay you this much. And ultimately the filmmaker has made film for public television <laughs> for no money. I mean, that happens. That genuinely happens a lot. So I think, I think uh, proper rates of pay and a proper space for documentaries mm -hmm. is urgent. Mm -hmm. A woman to that, Rachel. Anyone else? Um, I think maybe we need to be wrapping up actually, Steve. So um, yeah. shall I pass to you? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, again, hopefully my tech is uh, is working a little bit yep. better. Um, so so just to like so just to say a massive thank you to everyone, to everyone who's been contributing in the in the comment section as well, um, and to really emphasise that this is part of a consultation so we want to hear ideas and the ideas that that we receive we're going to filter down into a set of policy proposals that will hopefully then provide a foundation on which to build so kind of now is the time if you if you've got ideas or you you want to kind of make your voice heard please do write to us email uh, email me email alice quigley a researcher on the project um, and we will do our best to integrate all these ideas into some kind of coherent set of proposals. Yeah. And then, and then hopefully that gives us a, a basis uh, on which to take things forward. So the deadline to get ideas and feedback to us is the end of July. So 31st of July. Uh, and then we're aimed to publish proposals in the autumn. Um, but I really think obviously to just to stress again, that this is a marathon and not a sprint. And like, like we've been saying, you know, we're going to need people to, to take this work forward. And I think, you know, obviously they need to be paid for their work. It shouldn't, it can't, it won't happen if it's dependent on voluntary labor at the weekend. Um, so, so yeah, so hopefully we can, we can take things forward. Mm -hmm. And Steve, so in terms of the next steps, in terms of, in, I'm thinking about getting the voices and feedback of international yeah. sales agents, distributors and yeah, cinema yeah. workers. You know what? What? How do you involve them next? So we, I've, I think we've done about twenty interviews with distributors okay. in the sector. Um, not those two you mentioned, although I know um, Modern Films and Eve fairly well. Um, but yeah, we'll, obviously we'll talk to them as well. Um, and then I think we'll we'll have a, a focus group on that topic um, at, on the, uh, the the July the sixteenth, which is the day that that our focus groups will be happening. The idea there is that it's not going to be a kind of public event, but that people are very welcome to participate and that we'll have small groups, no more than five, six, seven people kind of workshopping policy change with their peers. Uh, and then um, I, hopefully out of that, we'll have a sense of kind of different working groups to take things forward and we can look towards accessing funding to, to develop that. Um, so, so yeah, just to, that, that, that's kind of the of where our focus on distribution and exhibition will be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Um, we've just got a few minutes left. So um, yeah, as Lindsay has just put in the chat, I wish we could have a massive group call of not just us here, but everyone on the chat because there's some really significant people listening. So that's great because together I think we can do a lot. Um, has anyone got any final things that they want to say haven't had a chance to say yet or in response to any of the chat i think there was one last thing that i was thinking about was mentor mentorship yep um because i think mentorship can be crucial and as somebody who's been doing it quite a long time i would absolutely love to be 
you know, really uh, actively being helped to mentor other people. I mean, I do it unofficially all the time, as we all do, but that would be great to have, to have funding, to have structures, to have some kind of support around that. Um, uh, because I think it's crucial in the, the report, they're saying that the older generation, and I'm over 50, and I'm looking at the younger generation thinking, how the hell can they access the world that I inhabit? You know, and I want to be able to pass that on. So just to flag, that's, that's really crucial, I think, to this process as well. Yeah, I would back that up and actually say about training as well. Sorry, Eloise. Um, the, just the, the money um, for, for filmmaker support and training, especially not just beginning career, but continue professional development. We used to run courses. There's no money for it anymore. No. There's a real massive problem. And it shouldn't just be called training. It's continued professional development. The, the, the role that plays is massive. It pays for people to mentor. You know, people need to be yeah, also yeah. paid for their, some people can do it for free and other people can't. And it's, it's incredibly important. Eloise. Um, I just wanted, I guess it ties into both of those things, but um, Jesse Gooch has made a really great point that we didn't get to get into, but we'd all spoken about, which was also seeing development as a really key and investable moment in terms of filmmaking. And that's something that I think we all know as documentary filmmakers, the way that, you know, there isn't just a principal photography time and when everything starts, but all of those people from diverse communities, but just in general, are underfunded and under supported. So it kind of creates this greater sense of distance because if you can't put the money in to go and pursue that story or if there's you know all of these other factors if you're telling difficult stories that have like a really you know intrinsically difficult weight on terms of your mental health then that gestation process gets longer and longer and longer yeah. and so the film takes longer to make the more money that's spent over those times so I think just in, a, in really simple terms like how can we be really clear and distinct in how you know, development is funded. I know several feature document, um, feature fiction writers who are paid to develop their scripts for like two or three years. And so why do we not see the same value in doing that for documentary, particularly when we know that we're working with real lives, with situations that can have, you know, a real adverse impact in terms of financial health, mental health. And so that's, I think, a key level at which we need to be sort of instigating change as well. Yep, wonderful. Great point. Paul, anything final to add from your point of view? Um, Rachel said it all perfectly. I think mentoring, to see more of it. Um, obviously, people have been mentioning screen skills. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much what I was going to say. So, good to hear. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I think we're at time. I think, yeah, there's, that was an incredible session. Sorry, I only joined half of it. But um, what I got was amazing. So, And it feels from the, all of the feedback that I'm... Um, everyone has a lot to say and a lot more to say. And so thank you, Steve and Alice for all the work that you've done. Um, Steve, would you like to close? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, just to echo that really, just to say massive thank you to everyone. And, um, and then, yeah, you know, onwards. I really look forward to, to taking it to, you know, taking things forward and seeing where we can go from here. So um, yeah, be in touch with us, please. <laughs> All right, cheers. Great. Thanks, Sheffield Doc Fest. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Eloise.